A'udhu Billah Minash Shaitan La Inna Rajeem Bismillah Rahman Rahim Dear respected brothers and sisters Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh Welcome back to another episode of Tales of the Tenth where we are joined by Father Christopher Kulhesi to talk about all matters to do with the Battle of Karbala the personalities, events and even the dreams surrounding this monumental occasion which we are commemorating during these holy and blessed nights Father Christopher, Assalamu Alaikum, welcome back. Lovely to have you back on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we've had a fascinating series of discussions so far, most recently talking about the villains of Karbala, even those before and after, those who participated directly in the battle, those who did not uh, engage in fighting, and even those who didn't show support for Imam al-Hussein, but still had a form of, of blame or, or uh, responsibility to, to uh, account for. Um, we also talked a bit about the dreams. Now, in, in our last discussion, you mentioned that dreams play a, a huge role in Islam. Um, today, I wanted, with your permission, to go into a bit more depth. Firstly, on dreams as a concept, not just in Islam, but also in Christianity and generally in, in, in religion, and why they are so important before we perhaps get into more contextualized discussions about dreams in, in regards to Karbala. Okay, so... so we could we could begin by saying that that the Jewish scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, are full of dreams. Dreams of Joseph, for example, but but dreams of of angels bringing messages to people. Quite often, those angels represent God Himself. It's not God being seen, but they represent God Himself bringing a message down. But, but He does it through a messenger. So the the Hebrew word for angel, of course, is malach, the same as malach, in, in, and it means messenger. So, so the Old Testament is full of dreams, but Joseph stands out as the great dreamer in the Old Testament, in the, in the Jewish scriptures. Far few, fewer dreams in the, in the Christian scriptures, except, of course, for the dreams surrounding the birth of Jesus, the dream especially not of, of Mary, because the, the, the angel coming to her is not a dream, it's a vision. I mean, she sees the angel, but, her, but Joseph has dreams, her, her spouse has dreams telling him what to do, and again, angels coming. So in the, in the Christian and the Jewish scriptures, dreams are well established as a means of divine communication. They have to be discerned carefully, but nonetheless, they are the ways, one of the ways in which God might get a message to people, and that's firmly established. So when Islam entered into the Jewish and Christian worlds, it was entering into a world where dreams were already a fundamental part of the way that God deals with humanity. They're not revelation. It's very, very important to underscore this, that dreams with divine messengers are not revelation. Um, and, and there's a hint in this which we'll see later on um, in terms of, of, of the idea of Jibreel coming in dreams to the prophet. Some of the, the Sunni texts change it and say an angel who'd never been sent before. In other words, not Jibreel. Because Jibreel is the bringer of revelation and this is not revelation. Nonetheless, Islam enters into the Christian Judeo-Christian Judeo world into a world of shrines, into a world where angels are greatly reverenced, and it simply takes on board, because it already holds this doctrine, the importance of angels and belief in the angels. We know this. It's very interesting that angels are the second part of the Islamic creed. After God, you have to believe in angels. Sure. Before the books and the prophets come the angels. Angels have a primary function in Islam more than in Christianity. Well, okay. um, so, so they're very important, and yeah. they are often the ones who are involved in the dreams. And Islam also inherited the idea of dreams. So there are a number of, of uh, texts of hadith in which the Prophet says, for example, did any of you have a dream last night? Come and tell me. He, he became the chief interpreter of dreams. After, after Yusuf, the Prophet was the great interpreter. Those are the two interpreters in the Quranic text and in the hadith text of dreams. First Yusuf in Surat Yusuf, and then the Prophet himself who begins to interpret the dreams that people have. And sometimes these are ru'ya, they are a vision or a dream that's good. Sometimes it's holm, uh, ahlam, which is generally a dream. I, th I hope I've got the two correct. I think yes, I have. Yeah. Generally a dream that is bad. And there are texts of hadith which talk about dreams that come from shaitan and dreams that come from God. So the point being that dreams became increasingly important in Islam. And we have earlier, early medieval texts 
about the interpretation of dreams. Ibn Sirin, for example, who was a, a famous Sunni scholar, and although he probably didn't write the book, in his name, a book of the first major book of interpretation was written. All of the great books of Sunni hadith have chapters entitled on the interpretation of dreams. So they're very important. Okay, having said that, turning to our, to our subject, there are a number of pre- and post kabbalah dreams that are of great interest. But let's start with the post kabbalah dreams because, and work our way back. And one of the most beautiful is this dream of the young Sukaina, who is in prison in Damascus. And she has this dream which she then is, thinks to keep secret, but eventually she does recount it. And, and, and uh, I, I have the dream, and, and unlike the dream of the mother of Muawiyah, which was cosmological. It had to do with the movement and stars and planets. This is a dream which involves personalities and personalities who are well known A, because they're well known in Islam, but B, because some of them were the personalities involved in the birth of Lady Fatima. Okay. The, the, the heavenly midwives yes. who came to help Khadija uh, deliver Fatima are present again for Sukena at the at the end. So this is the dream of Sukena. She she has this dream in which she sees these heavenly horses, five of them, these mounts, these horses. But the horses seem to be of light, of nur, uh, because they are heavenly horses. Each of them has somebody on the back of the horse, and a person of supreme importance. That's going to become clearer. And the horses are surrounded by angels who are leading them. They are they are. Elements from the life of Lady Fatima and the dreams around Lady Fatima with the same idea of angels leading heavenly mounts. So these mounts passed by and a servant approached me and drew near and said, Sukena, your grandfather greets you. And I replied, peace upon the messenger of God, but messenger, who are you? And he answered, I'm one of the servants of the garden. Then I said, well, who are these elders who are passing by on these mounts? And then he begins to list who they are. The first is Adam. God's choicest. The second is Ibrahim, friend of God, Khalil, I think Khalil. The third is Musa, the one who spoke with God. The fourth is Isa, Ruh Allah, the spirit of God. And then I said, well, what if, then she says, what about the fifth one? Because the fifth one keeps holding onto his beard and he seems to be falling off his horse. And she says, that is your father, Al Hussein. So she, she, she says, and oh, sorry, that is, that is your grandfather, I beg your pardon, the messenger of God. She, she says, well, where are these five horses going? And he replies, they're going to your, grand, to your father, Al Hussein. So she said, I ran after them because I wanted to tell them that he'd been killed by tyrants. Maybe they didn't know. So she's desperate that these five heavenly visitors don't realize that Hussein has been killed. And as she's doing so, five heavenly camels appear also of light, and on each camel is a woman. So she says to this messenger, who is an angel or maybe a servant of the garden, who are these women who have drawn near? And he says, the first is Hawa, Eve, mother of humankind. The second is Asia, daughter of Muzahim. The third is Maryam, daughter of Ibran. The fourth is Khadija, daughter of Khawailid. Then she says again, well, who's the fifth woman who seems to be weeping and putting her hand on her head and is swaying? And he says, that is your grandmother, Fatima, daughter of the messenger of God, mother of your father. So then Sukena says, well, I need to tell her then. She, the other five have gone off and she can't get to them. So she says, let me tell Fatima. So she rushes up to Fatima this vision of Fatima falls in front of her and says to her, by God, they have denied our rights. They have, they have regarded our woman as fair game, as people who can be played around with. They have eliminated all of our unity and they have killed our father, Al Hussein. It's a very moving thing because she's pleading in front. And, and then, of course, then Fatima says, I know all of this. I, and, and she's holding his shirt. I have his shirt with me, and I will not let go of his shirt Hussein, until I'm before God. And then I will hold the shirt before him and demand justice for him. So this is a, a beautiful dream and quite a complex story for a little girl. And it, it, it's slightly reminiscent of a dream recounted in the, the Hebrew scriptures of Yaqub, who sees angels going up and down a ladder to heaven because she says, I saw this door opened and there were angels coming down and angels going up again. So 
So she says to Yazid this dream, she says, shall I tell you? He says, yes. And at the end, he slapped his face and he wept and he said, what did I have to do with the killing of Hussein? This is Yazid pulling back. Mm. I had nothing to do. Then he curses all the others, Shimur and Ibn Ziyad, as he's washing his hands sure. of the event. Um, and then I've, I've said in the, in the text that, in fact, this dream appears with slightly different details. There's a, a greater description of the prophet who is holding his beard and weeping and of, of Lady Fatima. But it's always almost the same story. Um, so that's, that's Sukaina's dream. Um, and and it's, 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 it's a dream that is at the end of the story. Okay. Um, but there's, sorry, sorry. Okay, go. so the most important dreams of all are the dreams that, or the visions that the Prophet has in the house of Umm Salama. So we'll talk about Umm Salama later on. Umm Salama is, this, is the woman you want to meet one day in the garden. She's everybody's grandmother. She's that aunt that you would always go to with a problem. She is, in a sense, like Lady Zainab and possibly like Lady Khadija. There's just something powerful about her presence, uh, you know, and, and her age and her wisdom. So we'll talk about her. But her house is a place where the two boys, Hassan and Hussein, play often. So she seems to do a lot of babysitting, I think, to relieve Lady Fatima, who, who was, was, was struggling already with if, housework. If I can interrupt you. Yeah. For those who don't know Umm Salama and her relationship to the family. So she's the last surviving widow of the Prophet. Okay. Um, and beloved by people. Umm Salama is just one of these people that people love. And in a sense, she stands in the gap between two traditions in Islam and brings them together sure. because she's equally mutually, loved. Mutually, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, and she is also a transmitter of many hadith, important yes. hadith. And for the Shia, she is a transmitter of some of the most important hadith, like Kisa, for example, and some of the others. So, so she's crucially important because she's a trustworthy narrator. If Umm Salama is in the Isnad, then you will immediately perk up and say, well, this is going to be interesting because she really is an important narrator. But she's also a babysitter. She basically looks after these two little boys and they play in her house or outside of her house. So, so there's, a, there's a, an incident which always moves me because the picture is beautiful that, that, she, that the Prophet is in her house resting and Jibreel comes to him and he tells Umm Salama to stand guard over the door because he doesn't want anyone to interrupt them. He's conversing privately with Jibreel. And so she's meant to either hold the door or stand guard over the door. There are a number of different ver versions used. But she, anyway, she becomes the gatekeeper. And then, of course, little Hussein comes stumbling along. And he's still a very tiny boy. And he darts past her because she's an elderly woman. And he basically darts between her legs and he's through and he's in the house. She can't stop him, even though she tries to. In some, in some um, version, she actually picks him up and he starts to scream. <laughs> so she puts him down again because he wants to be with his grandfather. He knows his grandfather is there. He doesn't know Jibril is there, but he knows his grandfather is there and he wants to be there. Now, the whole point is... He had to be there. That's part of the story. That because Jibril is going to talk about him. So in a sense, he had to be there. It's divinely ordained that he would sneak past poor Umm Salama and get into the room. And there is the Prophet talking with Jibril. So the sense is that Al Hussein saw Jibril. Very few people saw Jibril. Mm. There are moments when he is seen and not recognized. But Hussein seems to have seen him because his grandfather was conversing with Jibreel. And then, of course, the story takes a very sad turn because Jibreel does a number of things. Sometimes he points to Al-Hussein and he says to Muhammad, do you love him? And Muhammad says, of course I love him. He's half my life. And then comes the prediction of, of this land of, of karb wa bala, this land of grief or suffering and, and, and desperation. And in some cases, this is the moment when Jibreel gives him some soil to Muhammad, which he's going to give to Umm Salama eventually. But it's the dialogue that occurs between Jibreel around this little boy who's now sitting on his father's lap. In fact, he's climbing all over his grandfather because he liked to climb on him. And the Prophet let Hussein do that. And while Hussein is there, Jibreel is predicting that he's going to be killed. And he's going to be killed, he says, to, by your own community. It's very important. Not just anyone, it's your own community who is going to do this. And, and as the texts develop, al uh, at, at first the prophet is just a passive recipient of the message. Sure. But as the texts develop, he becomes quite demanding. He says, would that I knew who was going to do this, the names. 
And finally, he says to Jibril, show me the place. That's what I want to see. Mm. Or sometimes Jibril says to him, would you like me to show you the place? And then you have this mystical vision of the prophet in which Jibril thumps on the ground either with his fist or with his wing, or he extends his wing and he produces red clay or red soil from Karbala, which is sometimes in this um, little glass container. So it becomes this famous Karura Hadith of the little glass vial, and sometimes it's not, and the prophet puts it into a glass vial and gives it. So this is, this is crucial because Umm Salama's house becomes the place of divine activity. Not revelation, but Jibril bringing a message to the prophet about a, a future event. And the Prophet beginning or then already to grieve, already weeps over Karbala. And Hussein is still just a tiny little boy. So the rest of his life, the Prophet lives with this foreknowledge of what's going to happen after his death, that his grandson will be murdered. This is how he lives for the rest of his life, however he wo- old he was at that, at that moment. So Umm Salama's house begins to play a very important role. It's very Im- interesting that a number of texts... First of all, I mean, the Quran never says Jibril is an angel. It never calls him an angel. It calls him lots of other things. Faithful spirit, spirit, our spirit, ruhana. It never says he's an angel. So sometimes we have to ask, well, what is Jibril? Is he a step higher than the angels, maybe? Wait a minute, we'll, we'll talk about Jibril. Yes. Yeah. But, but in the texts, he is sometimes most often named as Jibril, but there are some texts, mostly Sunni texts, that are quite anxious that if it's Jibril, people might think that this prediction is revelation. Because this story is carried by Ibn Hanbal, by all kinds of other Sunni. It's there, in Umm Salama's house, quite clearly. But sometimes they name this angel as the angel of the rain, rather than as Jibril. But more interesting is when the angel is called an angel who had never descended before, i.e. not Jibril, some other angel. Um, because they're trying to preserve revelation, the divine nature of revelation, from these private uh, pieces of information that the prophet receives from Jibril, who in that case is not bringing divine revelation, but something else. So this is a a dream that is at the center of the Karabala story. And the vial of, of soil, which is going to change to blood on the day of Karbala, is in the possession of Umm Salama for all of those years. How many years from the death of the Prophet till the death of Hussein? All of those years, Umm Salama keeps this vial and she looks at it every single day. Must be about 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for, for 49 or something sure. years, 50 years, she looks at this vial every day of her life, waiting for something to happen because the Prophet had told her, the Jibril had told him, it will turn to blood. And on the day of Karbala, it's turned to blood. Mm. And then she goes out into the streets of Medina, uh, probably Medina, and announces his death. And everyone says, how do you know this? And she, she explains this dream and this, and they mock her. They say, oh, ahlam, fake dreams, bad news dreams, confused dreams. They mock her, but it's not. She's 50 years she's held on to this. It's an mm. extraordinary story for me. And so you have these magnificent dreams that begin in the Prophet's life about Karbala and that end with Lady Sukaina, this little girl in a jail cell in Damascus, who sees this great vision in mm-hmm. heaven. So the dreams, of course, as we know, are real indicators as to the magnanimity of the event of Karbala and how it was foretold through, as you say, communication from Allah to the Ahlul Bayt and even not just to the Ahlul Bayt but also to other members of, of the Ummah, other people whether it's um, the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt or even those who are related to the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. There's an interesting, uh, I know we briefly touched on it in the past, the, the dreams of Hind, the wife of Yazid, of course, is something which, um, which we've mentioned. Could you tell us a bit about that? So the dream of the second Hind, I call her, yes. because otherwise you mix her up, unfortunately, with, with, with the mother his, of Mawiyah. mother of Mawiyah. So Hind... Hind comes into the bedroom of Yazid. And again, Yazid is already chastened. He's been rebuked by Lady Zainab in his court and told that he's useless. He's been told this dreadful dream by Sukaina, which, which he slaps his face and, and defends himself. I had nothing to do with this. So he takes it seriously. He doesn't say, oh, stupid girl. He really takes it seriously. Yeah. And then his, his mother comes into, the, into his, the room. His wife? His wife. His wife sure. comes into the room. And it's an interesting dream because it ties up 
very, very closely with a dream in the Christian text about Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate's wife had a dream about Jesus. And she goes to Pontius Pilate and she says, don't do anything to this man. I've had a dream and I'm telling you now, leave him alone. Pontius Pilate chooses to reject the dream. Now, now the, the dream of, of, of Yazid's wife is much more expansive. It's, it's a broad dream um, in, in which she, she also sees something heavenly, a gate in heaven opened or a door in heaven opened and, and a number of the personalities of the Achel Beit. She goes to Yazid and, and tells him the dream and he turns his face to the wall and again he says, this has got nothing to do with me. What have I to do with Al, Al Hussein? I've got the um, the text of the of, of the dream um, because it's 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 quite interesting. Um, she said I, she'd gone to bed, she'd gone to sleep, and she said I saw a door open in heaven, uh, some sort of yeah opening opening in heaven, and angels descending, squadron after squadron of angels coming down from heaven, and they were coming to the head of Al Hussein, which was there. In, in Yazid's drinking hall, it was there in his palace, coming to the head of Al Hussein, and all of the angels were saying, Peace upon you, Ab Abu Abdullah, uh, peace upon you, son of the messenger of God, etc. So, and while I was still sleeping, I looked at the cloud that had been coming down, and there were people walking in it, people who had a sparkling color. Among them was one man in particular who was radiating some color, and his face was like the moon. So, as soon as you hear that, you know who we're talking about because. The prophet has often been called this. He had a, Fatima said, my father had a face that was like the moon. Mm. He, he draws near and he kisses the head and said, my son, they've killed you. They never knew who you were. They've stopped you from drinking water from the river. I am your grandfather. This is your father Ali. This is your brother Al Hassan. This is your uncle Jaffa. And this is Aqil. These are Hamza and Alabas. So all these martyrs are there. And he begins to name all the martyrs. And Hind wakes up and she's appalled by what she's seen. And she, she looks and there's a light over the head of Al Hussein. So she rushes to the bedroom of her husband. And he's already in a dark room lying with his face to the wall before she arrives. And, and she, she tells him the dream and, and he says, what have I to do with Al Hussein? And the, 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 the text ends by saying, anguish had fallen upon him. So Father Chris, for Yazid, it's ironic because he must acknowledge the, the, the holiness and you know, the, the, there must be a level of conviction for him to admit that you know, his wife is having a dream at the same time that he is responsible in some way, shape or form for what that took place. He did not silence, say, the Sokena when she came to him and said, I want to tell you my dream. He didn't tell her to sit down or something worse. But at the same time, he has the audacity to say, what have I to do with Hussein? There's a degree of arrogance, perhaps, or, or distance. So what he's doing, in my mind, is he is dissociating himself by his lack of proximity to the, the Battle of Karbala. He is sitting in his court in Damascus. The next closest person is Ibn Ziyad in his Kufa palace and then you have the men on the battlefield like Shimmer and the others. And Yazid seems to be using his distance from the battlefield as a way of dissociating himself saying I wasn't there and, and in fact in one text he says if I'd been there I wouldn't have killed Al Hussein. He refers to him as my brother as, as you know so he's trying to plead innocence and friendship with the Akhul Bayt that doesn't exist to dissociate himself. It is interesting that he instead of Having, having Sukaina beaten for daring to suggest what she suggested in her dream, he, he just falls into anguish. Then his wife, he doesn't chastise his wife and say, don't talk nonsense to me. He turns his face again to the wall and, and, and anguish falls upon him. That anguish is the last note of his life, really. His life ends in anguish and despair because he, he can't actually dissociate himself. Mm -hmm. And his name will be forever forever um, associated with, with Karbala. And so will Shimmer. There's a famous dream in which Al Hussein sees a dog attacking him. It's a famous dream. And it's a, attacking it's a, Shimmer? No, attacking him, attacking Hussein. Oh, okay. So I dreamt of a dog attacking me. And the dog is, I don't know, a Dalmatian-like spotty dog. And, and it's Shimmer, because Shimmer apparently was a leper. He had leprosy. Oh. And, and it is predicted in this dream that the one who kills him will be this leprous man. 
mm. this spotty dog, a dog larger than all the rest and more vicious than the rest. And it's, it's Shimmer. So, so these names are never going to be forgotten. Yazid might have tried to get out of it, but his name will be forever associated with the murder of the Prophet's grandson. And, and he'll never escape that culpability before history on a political level and before God on a spiritual level. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, like as you mentioned, the association that Yazid has to Imam Hussein and to the battle will never be detached. No. Even from those who, who don't regard Karbala as a spiritual event or an event which was more than a, a battle itself, will always see Yazid as, as the one who stood against Imam Hussein, the one who brought tens of thousands to a battle of, of you know a handful or a few dozens. It shows a sign of, of weakness, of, of perhaps even fragility yeah. inside himself. And then we saw this later, as you mentioned, he was filled with anguish. Yazid, whether it was despair or it was hatred or it was, it was whatever it was, Yazid himself had a, a, potentially some sensitivity, some fragilities inside himself. Maybe he doubted himself. Maybe he 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 had a um, what's the word? What's the word? Like a, he wanted to show his his masculinity by overpowering Imam Hussein in number uh, and and detaching himself from Imam Hussein even after his his death. But it cannot be escaped, and it goes to show even in the dreams of the Ahlul Bayt uh, that it that uh, that his his status and his station will always be amongst the killers and, and the foremost killer of Imam Hussein. Um, before we wrap up, Father Christopher. A question on, say, the Sukaina. Now, we were talking actually before the show started about the, the variations in beliefs as to how old she was, what names she went by. Is there a difference between Sukaina and Ruqayya from a historical perspective? And I wanted to know what your thoughts were on this. Well, really, the, the person to ask this is, uh, is Jaffa Ladakh in, because he's written a superb work. Mm. On, on, on this, on Sukena especially. And in fact, I said he saved me a whole lot of groundwork <laughs> because there is this strange belief that among some mixing up who Sukena was, was she maybe she and Zainab might have been the same person or, and it's all, no, they were quite clearly, the trouble is that they are clearly people who go by the same name. Mm. You're not sure who you're dealing with because sometimes in the text, Sukena becomes Sakina depending yeah. on the vowel of the word. And you, is this the same person or is this somebody else? The Sukena we're talking about here is specifically the young daughter of, of Al Hussein, the very young daughter of Al Hussein. Who we believe is between three and seven yeah, years old. And or... whose aunt is Zainab. Correct. And who is imprisoned with the woman in the, in the, um, in the, in the jail. But, but there, you know, the trouble is there are a number of people called Fatima, a number of people who go by the same name, even Zainab, and one has to distinguish them carefully as one has to try and distinguish the children of, of Al Hussein, who is who and where do they come. So the Sukaina I'm thinking of is this very young girl who is, who is the, the, the niece of Zainab and is in jail with them and perhaps being looked after by Lady Zainab. She's, she's so you have a, a young girl going before Yazid. I was going to say she had the courage she to go She goes before Yazid because the caliph. I would imagine if you had a dream like that, you'd also have the courage to tell it. Yeah, I mean, it was an extraordinary Allah. dream. So yeah. yes, I mean, you know, what you could say is Muawiyah is the, lays the groundwork. Yazid is the catalyst. All the others, like Ibn Ziyad, they're just the lackeys sure. who do the job. It comes down to a father and his son who laid the groundwork and then set off a whole train of events. Of course, absolutely. Thank you so much, Father Christopher, and thank you to everyone at home who has been tuning in to the Tales of the Tenth series. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all your hajat, your deeds during these holy nights and to grant us forgiveness and also proximity to Abu Abdullah Hussein alayhi salam and to all of his beloved family and companions. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you tomorrow. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.